fabulous listeners. Thanks for tuning in to Old Bodies Outside. This is your host, Brian Peterson. This episode's guest is Mike Wardian, who has set a variety of running records and fastest known times. Also, he was strongly complimented on the Old Bodies Outside episode with Jonathan Ladson. Mike is a big inspiration of mine, and during this episode, we'll learn about how Mike approaches goals, maintains long-term motivation, maintains life balance and the power of mindset. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be on Old Bodies Outside. Hey, thanks so much for having me, guys. Yeah, yeah. Glad you're here. And, you know, as I mentioned in the introduction, you're a big inspiration of mine. And so during this episode, I do want to kind of set the goal of kind of hearing about some of your mindset and kind of psychological things that you do to set such big goals to balance your life. Those things really interest me a lot. And I think they have a lot of power in life too. And so um, kind of going through this, the progression of this episode, I thought we can go through some things of uh, some of your background and start digging deeper into kind of some of those psychological things that you do that have really helped you with your success and love and play of running. Yeah, man, I'm happy to talk about that. I think that um, for me, it's it's always been uh, a chance to you know see what I'm capable of and um, to set like big audacious goals and then you know, try to figure out how to, how to achieve them. Uh, and some of them are short term, some of them, <laughs> some of them are longer term. Um, but I, I like having a direction of where I'm, uh, trying to go and, and then, you know, trying to come up with a way to get there. Nice. Nice. So as I was preparing and I, I, I long for a while since I've known your name, um, I think I've seen, I saw you run at speed go. I used to live in Salt Lake city. Um, but oh, I, nice. for, for a long time held an assumption that you were a lifelong runner. And as I was preparing for the episode today, uh, my assumption was um, proven incorrect. And so I wanted to hear about how you got into running. Yeah, man, I was not a runner. I was a lacrosse player growing up. Um, so that was my primary focus. Uh, I, was, I was running primarily just to score goals. Uh, I was an attackman. So not even like one of the, you know, more... Uh, run centric positions in lacrosse. Like I was like the lazy guy that like stands in front of the goal and just like tries to get all the glory. And the middies are the ones who are doing all the work, running the ball up and down the, up and down the field. And um, yeah, I was, I, and I wasn't even like that fast or I was just, I had a lot of endurance. So I'd run around a lot with the ball. Um, and I played that from fourth grade all the way through uh, my junior year of college at Michigan state university. So I played, you know, at a pretty high level, like division one lacrosse. Um, and that was really my focus. And then I stopped playing lacrosse and picked up running just to stay fit. And, um, I love, I loved it. Like, I really loved it. Like, and I'm, I'm sad. I missed out on some of the experiences that, you know, some of my yeah, now being a professional runner, I have a lot of uh, you know, friends that grew up running cross country and track. And, um, I, I wish I would have had those experiences, but I, I don't, uh, regret being a lacrosse player. And I, I just jumped into lacrosse for the first time in like 25 years this year. And I loved it. It was, it was unbelievably fun. And, um, but yeah, I, I picked up running just to stay fit. I uh, didn't expect to, you know, ever be professional at it. I just wanted to see, you know, how far I could go. And, um, uh, I was just running around school really and decided to run my first marathon. And it was really my friend, Vic, uh, Vince voice and his mom, Vicky voice. And was the one who, uh, I was there for thanks or no, actually Easter. Um, and she had gotten back from the Boston marathon. And that's like the first time that I decided like, Oh, I want to, I want to do a race rather than just run around, uh, for my own, fitness. I just wanted to see like, Oh man, this is something that I always seen on TV and something that, um, I knew at some point in my life I wanted to do. And, um, seeing Vince's mom, you know, with the little unicorn medal and the space blanket and all that stuff, I was like, Oh, I, I, I really want to know how to do that. And she was nice enough to give me a little packet that had a training plan in it. And 
I basically just did whatever it said. So like I, the one nice thing about, um, you know, having been a lacrosse player and, and setting the goal of becoming, a, you know, an a college athlete or um, division one athlete, it was, you know, I had good work ethic. And so I was able to apply that to running. And I think, I mean, you probably know this and anyone that uh, has any longevity in the sport of running knows like the most important thing is just be consistent. And, uh, if you're consistent and you put in the work, like you're going to get better at running. Like it's a really straightforward, um, equation. Like if you can avoid injury and you're willing to go out there day after day after day, you're going to get better. Like you, there may be a point where you hit plateaus, but you're, you're going to keep improving and it's going to be easier and easier. And that's kind of how it was for me. I, I did really well in my, in my first race and, uh, I didn't actually know you had to qualify for Boston. So I qualified at Marine Corps marathon and then was able to run the Boston marathon. And after going to Boston and seeing all the people and having such a great experience at Marine Corps, I was like, man, these runners know something, this is cool. And I was pretty much hooked from then on. Yeah, well, that's, that's fantastic. And I was, I, you answer a lot of questions that I actually kind of was thinking in my head as you started explaining for yourself. And, you know, one thing was you probably picked up a great work ethic from being a division one lac lacrosse player at Michigan state university. Um, I, I was a division one runner. Um, and I was thinking about the lessons I learned through oh, that. Nice. And so like all the training and whatnot, all the, we, I mean, we train to be tougher in some ways. And there was things that were done during practice that would, would be unexpected to us sometimes, um, to make us more mentally tough or like the coach might add on an extra segment to the workout and you're, you're like, you're just done for the day. And it's like, okay, you got another, everyone's going to race two miles now. And you're like, oh my gosh, like we've already had an hour and a half of a hardcore workout. Um, but I got to imagine there's some crossover from that, from your lacrosse days. But one of the things is figuring out how to train effectively. Um, how did you figure out how to train effectively for, um, you know, maybe when it came time to do Boston? Uh, well, I was just training from that packet, so I didn't really do anything <laughs> different. Uh, but what I did do, and, and I think this is something that, um, was a big takeaway for me is I, after I qualified for Boston and then I ran Boston, um, I thought it was super fast. I think I ran like 250 and which is like fast for a lot of people, but for like, you know, the guys that work at running stores or like you guys, you know, coming from running division one, uh, it's not that fast. And so I went into the local running store, a store called Pacers here uh, in Arlington. And I was like, I'm super fast. Like I want to be on your running team. And they're like, dude, you're not that fast, but uh, you can come to our track workouts. And so they were basically selling me like a program, like a training program but they're like, you can just come for free and check it out and see how you like it. And so I basically just did that. And I put myself in the company of people that were better than me and that um, knew what they were doing. And I just basically like, I showed up to the first track work and I had no idea what they were talking about. They were like, we're going to run six, four uh, hundreds and then an 800. And I was like, I don't know what that means. Just tell me how many laps to run. Like I literally had no idea. Like I was like, how many times around the lap the track is that and so i i jumped in a group uh it was the third fastest group uh and it was awesome i jumped in with um two guys that i'm still friends with to this day a guy named jim bembo and a, a guy named rick poppleton and like they they've been all over the world to see me run now because we literally started out in this group and uh i'm still friends with them to this day um but yeah, I, I, in a, within a week or so I was in the second group and then all of a sudden I was in the first group, uh, and I actually knew what an 800 was in a mile. And, um, just like you were saying, I was like, Oh, you want to add on some more fine. Or like, Oh, you guys are all meeting up on Saturday to run. Okay, fine. I'll just show up. And so, um, yeah, I just, um, think it's important. Like if you want to go in to do something like you do it wholeheartedly and, um, you know, try to be put it, sometimes it's, it's good to be the worst person in the room, like, uh, and you can learn from the other people. And that's what I did. Um, and then six months later I made the team. So, uh, and then from there I was able to, you know, continue up the progress, like from the local team to a national team and, 
Um, and now I, now, now, you know, I get to do this professionally. Yeah. What, what year was that? Uh, so my first marathon was 1996 and I ran Boston in 1997. Uh, and that's when, that's when I joined the Pacers team and I still work with like the Pacers guys now. So my buddy, Chris Farley is like one of the owners of Pacers now. And, uh, I still stay in touch with those guys and another local running store here called Potomac river running. Um, and like the guy that, uh, that I, I basically found out all the guys on the Pacers team were going to this race called the Wawa 10 miler. And I was like, I'm just going to go and just beat all them to make the team. And I ended up going and I did not beat everyone, but I beat almost everyone except for this one guy named Jeff Van Horn who uh, owns Lucky Road running down in like the Richmond area. And we still joke about it because it was like he's like a shop owner now and and I get to run around the world as a professional runner. But he's like, I knew that day that you had something in you like because like I was, you know, I just refused to quit and uh, ended up, you know, being up there with him challenging for the win and you know he was just stronger but he was like wow this kid's you know this kid's you know got got a good work ethic and he's tenacious um and so it, it's cool to you know see my progress and and see where he's been uh over the course of the years yeah your work ethic and tenacity sound fantastic and you mentioned earlier that one thing you love about running is is the consistency and I want to know what that looks like when it comes time to say taper for a race. Um, are you a person that will just run every single day or are you like, Hey, like I have been running every single day for four months. I got a hundred miler coming up on Friday. So I'm going to take Thursday off. Like what, what does consistency look like for you when a race is coming up? Yeah, I'm not good at tapering. I, I hate it. Um, and I've gotten better, um, in particular, like before, I got, um, my first really big injury in 2012, I would never really taper. I would just run like maybe four or five miles or six miles before, uh, before a marathon or ultra marathon. Uh, but after I got injured and, and I came back from, I had five stress fractures and five hernias on my pelvis. And before that I would always do a hundred miles per week. And then when I came back, I realized like, I could maybe do 60 or 70 miles a week and maybe be like a minute or two slower. And I was like, wow, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of extra miles for not a lot of payoff. Um, and so I still will, I, I love doing high mileage. Um, but I am way more comfortable taking a day off, especially if you're like traveling and you have to get up at like three in the morning to do like five miles or something. Uh, but that being said, I'm going to Kauai marathon on Friday or on Wednesday. And my buddy's meeting me at like five in the morning so I can run like five or six miles before I get on a plane for like 12 hours. So like, I still prioritize like getting a workout in or a run in. Um, and yeah, even we did a trip to the Galapagos islands last year before I ran across the country and I was, it was a small boat and I wasn't sure I was going to be able to run, but I was able to you know, find guides that would let me run in the Galapagos. And then I was doing like burpees and stuff on the boat. And so there's ways, like if you aren't running, you can still get a workout in. Um, but that was something that before I got injured, um, that I wouldn't do, I would always just run right up until the race. And I feel like you don't really have to do that. So I, I believe that, you know, there is some value in allowing your body to recover and to be ready for the race. And, uh, sometimes I think of it now as like, I'm going to want those five or six miles at mile 90, you know, like, it'll be nice to have like those five or six miles that I didn't bank earlier in the week that I'll just get back during the race, you know? So I think of it more like that. It's like, oh, I'm going to get in 120 miles this week. Anyhow, like, does it have to be 125 miles? Like that, you know, doesn't really help me. Uh, but then I'd like, yeah we were talking earlier, like I'll do the depletion mile, like the day after when most people aren't doing anything. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to try the depletion mile and I should have done the depletion <laughs> yeah. mile yesterday. So I, I, um, I got run rabbit run coming up on September 15th and I, um, I could not find a 50 mile race to do this past weekend. And, um, I got a couple, so run rabbit run is 
three weekends out from now, the weekend before I found a 50K to do, the weekend before, which is this upcoming weekend, Labor Day weekend, I'm going to go out to Buena Vista, do some 14ers. This weekend okay. that just passed, I wanted to do a 50 mile race, but I could not find anything in my region. I looked in Kansas, I looked in Oklahoma, I looked in Nebraska, I looked in Missouri. Uh, so I went out and did my own 50 miler. I was like, you know, if there's not a race, I can still go do 50 miles by myself. Um, and so I did that on Saturday and Sunday I woke up and did an hour run and it's like, ah, oh, I should have fit in like a depletion 5k or something. But I have made a commitment to myself to make it happen at run rabbit run. Cause I've never done anything like that. And I think it's a, it's a really cool idea and, um, something that I got exposed to at hard rock. Uh, my wife and I both were, were thrilled over the idea. We'd never come across it until this past hard rock. And we're like, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. 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 I love it. Yeah. I think it's, it's a really good way to like kickstart uh, your recovery. And I think it's just mentally good for you to get out and, and know that your body is okay. And, um, yeah, you can do hard things. Like, I mean, you just did a hard thing, but then you can follow that up with like, okay, now, now that's done and I'm moving on to the next thing. Yeah. And this is one thing I, I really find inspiring about the way you approach running is you, you've taken this activity that a lot of people perceive it and view as just a singular activity. I'm going running. Like that's what you do for punishment. Um, and you have been able to find this like spectrum in it of all these different things you can do in running. And is that something that keeps you motivated with running, doing a lot of different stuff? I mean, it's, it's, it's wild. You've gone from, you know, doing all kinds of short road races all the way up to doing some really hardcore ultra marathons to, I think you just ran in May, ran across Panama. You've run across the United States. Um, is that variety part of the fuel of your motivation? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, and I do a lot of things that aren't like running. Like I do strength training. I play pickleball. Like I, um, play a lot of chess. Um, yeah, I, I, I have, I have a lot of different, uh, hobbies, uh, that I think, yeah, keep me active and motivated. But as far as like, I love the fact that I don't always do just trail runs or road runs or marathons or ultra marathons, but I, I like to, you know, do a little bit of everything. Like I did probably the worst, uh, specific training for hard rock this year. I ran like a bunch of like fast five K's at the beach that were completely flat. Um, <laughs> but that's where I was. And, uh, I was having a lot of fun, like trying to get a really fast five K for the year. And so, you know, I finally got into like the 15 minutes again and I, it was awesome, but I mean, it didn't really help me going up Handy's peak or, um, yeah, Grant Swamp Pass. Like it just, <laughs> you know, it wasn't that helpful other than, you know, I had a good, uh, base mile, like fitness and, um, yeah, I, I was, I was just excited to be out there. And so like, that's, I think what's awesome about like being able to have good fitness in general is you can do a lot of different things with that fitness and it doesn't necessarily have to be so focused on just one event, you know, especially if, I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to try to win the Olympic marathon, yeah, you probably want to do pretty specific marathon training, but if you want to be able to compete in a lot of different things, like I think strength training is really helpful. It keeps you, um, really resilient and, uh, with the ability to do, um, hard things and then, uh, speed work. I think like running a fast 5k is really helpful for just having a good aerobic base to be able to do some of the longer stuff. And then the longer stuff makes you, uh, have the strength to be able to like withstand, um, the demands of the short races too. So I think it all kind of works together and, um, yeah, for me, it's just fun to like mix it up. Like when I'm running 5k is like, I'm competing against like, you know, 15 to like 25 year olds. Uh, and then, you know, when you're in the longer races, you know, a lot of times the people are older and, um, you're competing against people that are like focused just on trail runs. Um, and then, you know, doing stuff at altitude coming from sea level is a different challenge. So I like, you know, being put in different positions and, and seeing how I do and, uh, I also like evolving as an athlete, like, you know, I've never just focused on one thing. Uh, and I think for me, that's allowed me to have a lot of longevity in the sport. And then also to just continue to have things that fire me up and, and get me out the door. So do you think trying running in different avenues and also just different hobbies, is it that newness that fires you up maybe? 
Uh, I don't think it's just newness because I mean, I've run a million five K's. Um, so it's not like new. Um, but I think it's just a different stimulus. Um, than if I just went out and trained trails all the time or slow miles, um, you know, I think it's just a different stimulus for your body. It's kind of like if you only went into the gym and just lifted chest and arms, that's, you know, that's one way to get big chest and arms, but it doesn't probably mean your legs are uh, going to be able to carry you or you have the scapula to be able to do pull-ups or that kind of stuff. So it's, I think you want to have, or I like to have like a well-rounded um, repertoire of different races that I do and, and different times of the year, I focus on different things, but I think they all kind of help each other. Like, I think the long stuff helps the short stuff and the short stuff helps the long stuff. And if you can kind of like stack them, uh, you can do some pretty cool things. Yeah. I, I like yeah, the way and, that you, first... and, and I do like, sorry, sorry to jump in again, but I, I do like doing new things. Like I like being the worst person at things. Like we just did a Red Bull, my buddy and I just did a Red Bull, uh, paddling and portage race and portage is just carrying the kayak, uh, which is super hard by the way. Um, especially if you have a heavy kayak, which we did. Um, and we were in dead last place for like a majority of the race. Uh, and so it's, it's fun, you know, being out there like chasing cutoffs, uh, cause that's not a position I'm normally in, but you, you, I mean, I've, I've been in that position before and, uh, you know, I, try, we eventually, you know, caught a couple people and weren't dead last, but we were nowhere near the beginning guys and girls. And so it's a chance to like, see where you are and then where you want to go. Uh, and then, you know, just having a different skill, like it's, it, yeah, it's fun. It's, it's a different way to explore the world. And I want to take advantage of as many ways to get out there and do things as possible. And, and you're tapping into all these different stimuli that exist out there. And regardless if you're going to be doing well or, you know, fighting against the cutoff, I, I find that really admirable. I think yeah. there's a lot of people out there that if they perceive themselves as not good at something, they're not willing to take on that challenge where it's almost seems like you're like, well, hey, that's a new stimulus I can take on. Let's see how I do and let's challenge myself. And where did that mindset come from for you? Um, I think, I, I think I'm pretty okay with not doing well. Um, but I am super hyper competitive. So, um, if I, if I, if I don't do well the first time, I'm pretty inquisitive also. So like I, within like, you know, if I, I'm going to do a post probably tomorrow about the paddling event I did, but I have like 13 or 14 takeaways of like things that I learned and things that I could have done better. And, I think that's what it's all about, right? Like no one's perfect. Like, you know, I can, can't tell you how many things I've done wrong over the course of my career in running and, um, you know, from eating like an Indian burrito the night before, like a marathon and then, you know, being sick all night, um, you know, not, not wearing proper shoes, forgetting your shoes. Uh, I mean, I just had a race, like I've been a pro athlete for 25 years. I had a race. I just brought two of the same shoe, like two right shoes. Like who does that? Like, uh, like I had the shoes laid out properly and I just brought two of the wrong, two of the same shoes. They look exactly the same, but they're both the right shoe. So like, that's why I lay out all my kit before a big race because like I've not laid my kit out and I've got to the start line and I don't have my chip or I don't have like safety pins. And so like you try to put systems in place so that you put yourself in the best possible position and, um, I think that that, that really helps is like, you know, being okay and comfortable with like stuff is going to go wrong, especially, you know, like it, the longer the race, the more chance something's going to go wrong and you got to be able to figure it out. And a lot of times it's like super minute decisions can have like huge ramifications. Like it could be like, uh, I should eat. Uh, I didn't eat. Uh, well, now for the next three and a half hours, I'm going to be trying to like catch up on like, all the calories that I didn't consume. So now my pace is going slower. So instead of three hours, it's actually five hours of like suffering or like, Oh, I should have filled this bottle or I should have brought an extra bottle. Like at hard rock, I forgot to bring a bottle, an extra bottle for that super hot part of the day on this, you know, just, and then I suffered for the next four hours because I was just dumb for one split second at an aid station. So like, 
that's what I love about it too. Cause there's consequences. Like if you, um, decide you're going to not change your shoes and socks, well then by mile 60, maybe you have a massive blister that's causing you to go slower than it had you just taken five minutes earlier and just change your shoes and socks. Um, and it's cool. Cause my, I, it's funny to see my son's gotten super into F1 and like, so he'll see like, you know, it's kind of like a car race in a sense. Also, it's like, you know, you're running low on fuel. Do you stop now? Or do you try to make it one more lap? Because if you stop now, like everyone might go by you, but then they might have to stop in three laps. And so you might catch them back later. And so like, I think that there's a lot of things in running that are similar to a lot of things in life. It's like, um, you have to make decisions and then you got to figure out if that's the right decision. And then the more, uh, different events you do and the more things that you put yourself in difficult positions, the more, uh, tools you have in your toolkit when things do go wrong, because eventually they will go wrong and you got to be able to figure it out. And most of the time you're by yourself or it's the middle of the night. Like I just, a couple of weeks ago, like did my first bike packing trip. Um, it was like 340 miles before that I'd ridden no more than 112 miles during an Ironman back in like 1999. So <clears throat> this one for me was a big event. And I basically left my house in, in Arlington, Virginia and rode all the way to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I didn't know if I was going to make it. I didn't know if I had the right stuff. Uh, my headlamp fortunately worked, but my lamp on my bike didn't work. Like the water that was supposed to be on the trail wasn't actually potable. So you couldn't use it. So like, I was like, Oh great. So I had to like nurse three bottles of water for like 191 miles. Um, and so like, that's just part of the game, man. You got to figure it out as you go. Uh, and I learned a, a ton of stuff from that adventure and I'm going to be able to apply it later. And when I do a race across New Zealand in January, but you know, I put myself out there just knowing like, I'm going to do some stuff wrong and that's okay. And then I'm going to learn from it and then, uh, hopefully not do it again. And I mean, I think that's all you can do in most of life. Like we're all going to make mistakes and, and have things go wrong, but you try to limit them each and every time and you get a little bit better and a little bit better. And eventually, you know, you, 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 don't, you try, you have that like special day when everything kind of goes your way and, and you, you make, instead of making one wrong decision, you make, you know, no wrong decisions and you have like that super flowy, perfect day. And I think we're all looking for that. But I like what you said, you know, we, we are all imperfect beings and, bringing that level of reflection that it appears that you bring an evaluation of did this work or did it not? Um, there's, I think that there's power in that of, you know, raising self-awareness, raising your critical reflection of yourself, having that lived experience and you bring on new challenges such as your kayaking race. And, you know, there's things that are applicable there, um, that, you know, maybe you've messed up in other types of, um, uh, endurance feats. Yeah. Well, and in life in general, I mean, like we all, like you make mistakes in, in all parts of life. And I think a lot of times, like the, you know, they say like running a hundred mile or a marathon is like a microcosm of life, right? You experience like life in a day when you're doing like a, like a long event. And, um, and I think you can take some of those lessons and apply it to life. I mean, like there's, you know, lots of things that are going to go wrong and in, in different parts of your life. And if you can have the resilience and consistency to, you know, keep moving forward, like good things usually happen when you do that. Yeah. I was thinking about, so I'm a professor at Kansas state university of park management and conservation. And when I was getting my PhD at Clemson university in South Carolina, my wonderful uh, advisor, when I was going through the dissertation process uh, to kind of keep me motivated in my, my, uh, fuel going, he, he equated it to, this is a hundred mile race. And so there was a point where I had miscleaned the data, messed it up, Brian, this is a hundred mile race. Like you got to stay resilient. You got to, and mistakes happen, right? We're human beings. It's a matter if you're going to move forward or not. And there's uh, you know, a saying that's very popular out in ultra running, uh, relentless forward motion. I think that was coined by Brian Powell. Um, and that's, you know, a great one that also is, you know, very, has a very strong metaphorical power for life. And I love having these conversations about some of the things with running that really do 
uh, transfer and they have high transferability towards things in life because as you mentioned and it's 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 absolutely true uh, it's as true as it gets we're all imperfect beings and therefore we're absolutely going to have mistakes in life and we can overcome them we absolutely can it's just you know keep moving forward with it yeah i mean i think that that's like i saw something i don't know where i saw it but it's basically like if you don't quit it's not over like it's not it's not final you know, so if you can just not quit, and I think that that's applicable to a lot of times in running, it's like, you may have messed everything up, but as long as you're ahead of the cutoffs and, and you, and you haven't quit yet, you, you know, you still have a chance. And I think that applies in a lot of things. Like you may have messed up a relationship or, uh, did something wrong at your job. But if you, you know, say like, Hey, I messed this up and you know, what can I do to make it right? Like a lot of times people give you that opportunity in life in general well yeah and there's a lot on the internet about um kind of having this like don't give up mindset i'm thinking of like david goggins kobe bryant are there is there anyone i don't know if you've ever kobe bryant like there's gotta be more expletives if i was saying it probably like yeah like if it was david goggins you got you you gotta you gotta be a little bit like uh more drill stars in me maybe Absolutely. Yeah, I think we all can think of uh, how David Goggins sounds. Um, but the, there's a lot that I sometimes will get into flipping through reels, which isn't a best use of my time, but it will keep me motivated. And one of the things that I've actually learned from... Oh my God, those from... things are great. Yeah, yeah, I know, man. I, I feel like there's a lot of really good ones. Uh, there, I, I, there is. Or and I think TikToks or whatever. Yeah, for sure. There's one that uh, it was from David Goggins that was like, no matter what the morning is, you got to get up. If it's raining out, you got to get up and you got to tell yourself, I got this. So now every time I'm getting up and it's say 4.30 in the morning, I like to run in the morning, get it done with and then tend to the kids, tend to work and whatnot. And it's 4.30 in the morning and I don't want to get up and do my hour and a half run or whatever. Um, it's, it's I, I lay out my kit too. That makes it easier to get going. But then the first words in my head to myself is you got this. And that seems to propel me. It's like a springboard. <laughs> Yeah, dude, that's good. Like everyone has something, right? And I think, um, you know, it, it might be you got this or there's another one that I saw. It's like you can either sleep with the dream, sleep with your dreams or wake up and chase them or something like that. But I mean, all those are great. And I mean, whatever resonates with you. I mean, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just like uh, write down all my goals for the year. I don't know if you can see yep, that. Yep, 2023 goals. Yeah. And I'll just put them on a post-it note, like right where I see them. And then as I do them, I just check them off. Wow. Um, and you don't get them all or maybe you do, um, but it gives you something to work towards. And a difference between the two of us and it's something that I've not been able to go after. And maybe this will actually um, be the pivot for me, but I'm impressed by the big goals. I'm impressed by a lot of things you've done, Mike, but the big goals that you have done, um, I've not gone over, like I've, the, I've done hundred mile races. A lot of people consider that big goals and depending on the person that very much is a big goal, but you've run across America. You've done some really, really big time goals. And, and we're talking bigger than big. And how do you get your mindset into doing that? I mean, like you're a person that have you run the Appalachian trail? No, that's my next. Goal. No. I'm, okay. I mean, yeah. you're, 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 yeah. So how do you, that's a, I've not gone to that level of setting goals and, and how, how did you get to, uh, maybe it's for you, it's just natural. I mean, no, not at all. Like it, I, it's super scary. Like that's what I think. I try to set these big, uh, you know, kind of audacious goals and, um, and then try to take steps to, to be prepared. Like, so for the Appalachian trail, that's something that's been on my list. Like ever since I was young, like I kept always saying, like, if I ever get fired from my job, like I'm going to, you know, do the Appalachian trail. And luckily, <laughs> luckily I haven't gotten fired, which is good. Uh, and now I'm like one of the owners of the company. So, I mean, I, it's going to be harder for me to get fired, but I mean, I guess it could happen. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like, I prepare, you know, and so in 2019, I uh, ran across Israel as like a trial run on the Israeli National Trail to set an FKT and see how my body would respond uh, to running 100 kilometers a day. And I, I felt great. I mean, it was really hard and um, but it was a short, 
a shorter, you know, test basically to see like where I was and what I needed to do and, you know, how my body would be able to cope with that. And then I was planning to run across uh, the U S in 2020 and then the pandemic happened. Uh, and I, or I'm sorry, I run the Appalachian trail in 2020 and then the pandemic happened. Uh, and so I didn't do it. Uh, and then I got hurt in 2020, like pretty severely injured my back. Um, and so I, I put off, uh, running the Appalachian trail and then decided to run across the U S because I was like, I, if I like, if I never get another opportunity, like, uh, to run across the U S I'm going to regret it the rest of my life. And so I did the run across the United States and then I was going to, and I am going to follow it up with running the Appalachian trail. So I just went to my biggest goal that I could think of right away because I was like, this is something like so epic. And I mean, not that the Appalachian trail isn't, but the Appalachian trail is a little bit shorter. And I was like, I, you know, you could always just you know, hike the Appalachian trail, but like running across the country and also run, uh, running across the U S scared me so much. Cause I was really terrified of like cars and traffic. And so I was like, I'm going to do the most scary thing to me. Whereas the Appalachian trail, like doesn't scare me as much, which I think may just be naive. I'm just naive because like, I think it's going to be hard as hell. Um, but it's like, like the cars and like traffic is what caused me to be so scared of running across the country. And I was like, I'm going to face like my biggest fear. Um, and yeah, I, I did like, I'm super comfortable. Like I can run right next to a tractor trailer now and be like, okay, fine. I don't care. Um, mm -hmm. which I guess is good and bad. Cause like, I, I literally am not scared at all, which I probably should be because, you know, they don't really care about, you know, pedestrians in that, you know, it, yeah, it's, I'd say like I was, I was fortunate. Like there was a lot of close calls, um, but I'm very comfortable around traffic now. Well, I think going after these, this goal that scared you and it, you, you had very specific things you were scared of. Um, that's amazing yeah, to do. And like um, super scared. <laughs> yeah. Like I, that, I was terrified. Like the first like three or four days, like I would jump off every time a car came. And then yeah. eventually I was like, there's no way I'm going to make it across the country. If I spend like 3000 miles going east to, or west to east, and then a thousand miles going north and south, like it's just not going to happen. Um, <laughs> and then yeah, it would have been you, good you, to, you, you, yeah, it would have been fun to, to quantify. It would have been good to quantify your north and south, the south lateral movement as you're moving towards the east oh coast. Gosh. There was a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it definitely slowed down as I got closer to, uh, uh -huh. closer to the East coast, but it's, it's also, it, it was just, yeah, it was a lifetime dream. Uh, and so I just, That's awesome. like, I'm going to make this happen because you never know what's going to happen in life and there's never going to be a good time. Like, I think that's the other thing I was looking for a good time, like a, you know, a, a specific break in my life because, I was like, Oh, that's how you do it. Like, cause most people that, um, do these kind of big adventures, like they just quit what they're doing. And I was like, I don't want to quit my life. Like I like my life. I like my job. I love my job. I love, you know, my family. I love all, I, I love my life. I just need to be able to take myself out of my life for a little bit and, and chase this dream and then reinsert myself back into my life. And it turned out I just kind of worked while I ran uh, and had somebody, uh, that was just awesome, uh, at my company, be able to help. And then was, I think the biggest thing too, is like to get, you know, the people that you care about on board with your dreams too. And all my sponsors were so helpful. Um, and the people I work with, you know, were super accommodating. And, um, I think that that was a big thing for me is like making sure that, um, I honor my obligations, but still kind of chase these dreams and goals and, I think that's what you got to do. You got to figure out a way to, you know, be able to meet your obligations and, and your commitments. Um, but don't give up on your own goals. Like, I think that's super important. Um, because people, people, people will help you if you ask and, and you, you let them know what you're trying to do. Yeah. I could see where getting help and support with doing those big goals is, is absolutely needed. Uh, and also I thought it was really cool with your run across America. That wasn't, 
you, you, yes, you ran from the West coast to the East coast, but you also helped out a charity. And uh, what charity was that? Yeah. And how much did you raise? Uh, so the charity was world vision, uh, USA, and the goal was to raise a hundred thousand dollars for clean water. And because of people are awesome and a lot of people supported it, <laughs> we ended up raising over $125,000, um, and built a well in Southern Ethiopia. Um, and it was pretty awesome. Like the well cost about $181,000 or so. And so, you know, it wasn't all of the well, but it was a large chunk of the well. And I got to go visit it this year uh, with World Vision. And so that was, that was unbelievable. Like so impactful it was just to see how many people it's uh, serving and that it will continue to serve. And it's like a green well that's like runs on solar and it's just changed the lives and um, of the people that it's serving, but then also their kids and, and their kids' kids. Um, so it's got about a 20 year lifespan or so. So it's going to, you know, change this community for a long time. And then it can be, you know, fitted again to continue to, to help people. It's just, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything better than, you know, being able to do what you love and help people in the process. Right. Right. And using running as a means to help other people. And it was, was it that trip to Ethiopia that Jonathan Latson joined you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, he mentioned I it. Met, I met Jonathan, uh, on the run. He came and ran with me. He's like, lives pretty close to me. So he came and ran with me when I ran through, uh, my neighbor, like my area here in Northern Virginia, uh, and then it was pretty awesome. He ran with me the last day when we did over a hundred miles and that was his first hundred miler. And I think his longest run by like 40 or 50 miles. I was like, dude, you're really good at this. You should, you should consider doing some of these because you're pretty much, uh, running like as fast as I am and you look great. Um, and yeah, he's done some pretty epic things. Like he's a super cool guy. Uh, and then he came on the trip, uh, that we did just this year and, uh, was able to sponsor some kids. Um, so instead of, uh, raising money for clean water, we actually raised money to sponsor, uh, children directly in the communities that we mm -hmm. raised, that we, um, help provide the clean water. So that, that was really impactful too. So I kind of stepped up to the next level and our family's now sponsoring a, one of the children from one of the villages that, um, is using the water from the well that we helped build or that all of us helped build. Um, so it's really cool. It's like this full circle type um, engagement that, that, yeah, that's cool. Like I was always worried about, um, you know, what it would feel like to be so invested in, in a charity like that. And it's been nothing but in uh, positive. And I think they do really nice work. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that we've had that experience and I look forward to like working with world vision, doing a lot more cool stuff in the future and other charities. Like I do stuff for like, uh, Achilles international and St. Jude. And, um, there's, there's a lot of great charities out there and I've been lucky enough to be able to partner with some of them over the years. Yeah, Mike, that's wonderful. I, I did not know that about you with your, your charity work. Um, I, I did know that your run across America had, you know, a charity component to it, but that's, that's really cool. And I think I'm sure probably in the future, you'll, you'll, um, brainstorm some fun ways to bring running into the mix to, to use as a means again, cause it's, it's a wonderful means for raising money. Um, and so that's yeah, fantastic. Really they did that. It is. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's cool. Like, I think, uh, I think also like, and I've mentioned this to people before and I actually coach a guy that just started, uh, pacing people. But I, I do that quite often with like, um, you know, people that are physically challenged. Um, and so I've done uh, guiding of like double amputees, uh, visually impaired athletes. I just uh, helped pace an autistic kid to his first sub three hour marathon. This guy, Dylan, wow. he was just awesome uh, at the Boston marathon. It was like one of the coolest days of my life. Like he just had such a great race and just um, absolutely crushed it. Um, so it, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, if we have this gift that, and we can, you know, share that with people and help them achieve their goals, it's just, uh, another way to, you know, help give back to the running community, but also, um, 
I, I tell like, especially ultra runners, like you're going to, like, you were looking for something to do this past weekend. Like, you know, if you're out, you know, and looking for a run or something, I mean, it's, it's great to just jump into a marathon or ultra marathon and pace somebody because you'll have to go slower and carry all their stuff or help them. And, um, you can get a great workout in for yourself. So like, um, you know, if, if you're like, what about me? Like, how, do, what do I get back besides helping someone like achieve their dreams and realize their goals, which is pretty much awesome in itself. Like you still get a good training benefit from it and it's going to be, you know, probably slower than you're normally running. Uh, you'll have to be mindful of everything around you. So you become super hyper aware of like the course and everything, and that'll help you in, in your runs. Um, and then, I mean, the coolest thing is just getting to see somebody's face and reaction when they achieve their dreams, or even if yeah. they didn't have the best day, you know, you were out there helping them, you know, do something that they love to do and they wouldn't be able to do it without you. So like just that benefit alone is, is worth it to me. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Uh, well, Mike, we're, we're coming close to winding down here and I did want to um, just kind of ask you one more question. And we, towards the end of our conversation here, we got into all the great things that, um, your help now with, with in life and charities and whatnot and using running as a means. Um, but also, you know, you are, you know, a father, a husband, a dog owner, you got multiple hobbies, you own a business and how do you balance, you know, all this love in all these different directions with, you know, your family, your dogs, love of running, uh, your business. Uh, how do you balance Fantasy that? Football. What is it like? fantasy football that's right what does a regular day look like for you to balance all this uh well well, right now it's draft season so i have like 10 teams that i'm (laughs) that i'm drafting so it's a lot of uh fantasy football podcasts while i'm running uh, a lot of research um a lot of talking to my friends being like do you think Bijan robinson should be the number one pick um but like i'd say for me, it's like, I, I mean, this is the thing that it sounds like you do too, is like uh, getting up early is is one of the keys to success for me. It's like, I usually, I have a, on my chorus, I have like a 445 alarm that goes off every day. And, you know, I'm trying to get up from that so that my backup alarms don't wake everyone in the house up. Um, and yeah, I try to get after it. I usually have my first workout by 530 come home uh, now that it's uh, school season with the kids, like they're older now, but uh, try to make sure that they have what they need and get out the door with my wife, Jennifer, and then uh, take the dogs on their walk. Uh, and then I go for my next workout or today I had some deadlines. So I just worked until they were done around 11 and then got another workout in uh, and then try to, you know, start doing um, whatever needs to get done. So, um, I've got some pickleball coming up, so that's going to happen. And then got another draft and, and then try to wrap up work for the day too. So, um, I think it's just about trying to be as efficient with your time as possible. So, you know, I'll be, um, you know, doing something for work while I'm running or, um, try to get, get my first, you know, primary, thing that I really want to do, I try to stack that in the morning. So like if it's a, you know, a tempo run or a track workout or a session with my physical, uh, or my personal trainer, like that's going to happen before most people need me. Uh, and then everything else I'm going to slot in around that. And then when I was going to an office, I would just run commute or bike commute. So like trying to make, uh, that a part of my day where it's like, you know, I know I need to go there. Uh, how can I do it and still get my workout in? And so I was telling my brother today, I'm like, I usually talk to my brother every morning on my run. So like, even if we can't run together, like we're still able to like stay in touch. And, um, I was saying like, Oh yeah, I just, you know, just do like 45 minutes here, an hour there, like, uh, you know, and some days it, it works out where I get everything I'm looking to do in and other days it, doesn't but you know if that's the case i'll make it up the next day and yeah just get up early is the key no one wants to hear that but like that's that's really the secret that i've found and then if you can too like you know do it do it while you're not needed somewhere else so like 
you know, I go for a lunch run, like, you know, that's when, and then I'll just eat at my desk. So, um, you know, no one expects you to, to be at your desk the entire day anymore, which is nice. Yeah. Fantastic, Mike. And you make it, you said in a way that is accessible for people to do, right? Um, you can double up some stuff. You can go running, call a family member. You can skip going out to lunch for 30 to 45 minutes with colleagues, get a run in at that time and, you know, being efficient with your time. I thought that was a fantastic way to look at it. Um, well, Mike, it's, it's coming to the end of our episode here. Um, thank you so much for coming on to old buys outside. I, um, sent you a, a cold message on Instagram. We've, the only time we've interacted is you passed me a depletion mile flyer, got me inspired. <laughs> and uh, you well, got good, me inspired. Man, I'm glad. Did you wait? Did you come out and run too then? I, cause there was so, there was a lot of people there. So I didn't, I didn't note everyone. Oh gosh. Came. There's a ton of people there. Yeah. So I, we, we were on the course next to each other. Um, I was with, I don't know if you know who Paul Jesse is, but um, you came into Chapman Gulch when he had been there for a few minutes. Um, so he got out okay. maybe a couple minutes ahead of you, um, uh, while you were kind of getting replenished. And then we were all in a conga line going up, uh, Grant Swamp Pass. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then. Okay. Like, so towards the end. Yeah. Right? So I, I did Chapman was... Gulch to the finish. Okay, cool. Yeah. 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 That was, I was actually running pretty well at that point. Like I think, you caught up to us. Like I, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I was struggling because I was stupid and didn't take water going into that place. Uh, and I had to sit there for a while and just like be like, you were dumb. You're in the penalty box, like drink some stuff, eat. And then I was like, OK, I got to go because like it's not going to get any better. So yeah, well, that was but then eventually I felt better. And I also had Hillary. She's a really good motivator. Yeah. And my pacer, she's awesome. Like she's just like so cool and just easy to easy to be around and good motivation. Like she knows like all the right like ways to get you motivated. Um yeah. And then I tried to drop her because I'm just like mean like that. And she was like <laughs> not having it. But then I actually did drop her like the last like two miles, like going I caught like three people from the river to the finish. No way. That's, Which I mean, that's fun. only what, two miles? Yeah, it was two miles, but I was hammering, dude. Yeah, it was crazy. Like, I got on yeah, that dirt road and flew. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, well, you had, to, I thought we were, yeah, you had to go across the street and then up into the woods. Mm-hmm. And then everyone's like, oh, crap, man, this isn't just the end. And I was, there's like, still okay, some I'm uphill. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you have to go up, the, like, to mine shaft road or whatever to the the little Karen thing and then make a right. That um, catches you. Yeah, you know that catches you. I was able to. Yeah, I think my last mile was like five fifty four or something. Like I was moving pretty good <laughs> at that point. So but, did you have? But I suffered did, earlier. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, Paul was cursing out the downhill in the Chapman Gulch from for many miles up on the approach to Grand Swamp Pass. How horrible <laughs> it was. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to ask you, like, you may have had one of the faster, if not the fastest, I don't know, um, last like 10 miles, last 20 miles. I mean, it sounded like you, you did really well there. Uh, I don't think the no, cause I did really bad going up like super bad. Like I was like so terrible, but then once we got up to that last part, yeah, I was moving pretty good. I don't know how, like. I, I mean, I don't know if I was moving as fast as like Courtney and those guys, but maybe, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but yeah, I, I was, yeah, I was terrible on the way up. Like I was like shuffled, like zombie walking. Um, but you know, that's just part of the deal. Like that's what happens when you don't take enough water. Um, right. That's what I was going to say. Things, like we were talking about earlier. It's like, that exactly. was a poor decision. And now I'm going to have to eat it for two and a half hours. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, yeah. thanks so much for, for inspiring me. Uh, I'll be doing the depletion mile after run rabbit run. And you've also inspired me to set some bigger goals in life. So I really appreciate it, Mike. And thanks again for coming on to old bodies outside. Yeah, man. No worries. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And don't forget, man, you can pace people too. It's, it's, it's pretty fun. Yeah. Okay. All right, everyone listening, that's the end of our episode. Adios.